Okay. Welcome to the Kingdom War Room. Each month we will conduct a Kingdom War Room discussion with key leaders in the body of Christ that will deal with strategic issues regarding end time prophecy, as well as issues facing the body of Christ worldwide. In the discussion today, we have myself, Dr. Michael Lake, representing the Kingdom War or the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing and Biblical Life TV. My website is www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. My cohort in Kingdom Endeavors, Dr. Mike Spaulding, who is the teaching pastor of Calvary Chapel in Lima, Ohio, who is the author of Upside Down in America. He has also written 10 other books or more. Mike, I've lost count on how many that you have written. When I grow up, I'm going to try to keep track of just how many. I'm going to try to catch up with you one of these days. And uh, Mike's uh, email or website is www.drmikespalding.com. And we're blessed today to have Dr. Douglas Hemp. Uh, Douglas, or uh, Doug, uh, has earned his MA in the Bible and its world from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, his PhD in biblical studies at Louisiana Baptist University. He has served as an assistant pastor at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, for six years, where he lectured and developed curriculum at the School of Ministry, the Spanish School of Ministry, and Calvary Chapel Bible College Graduate School. He's the author of numerous books, articles, DVDs, and has appeared on national and international TV, radio, and internet programs in English and in Spanish. And he is also the senior pastor of The Way Congregation in Denver, Colorado, and his website is www.douglashamp.com. Gentlemen, it's great to have you with us today on the show. Thanks for having me. I really, it's great to be here and great to be with you guys. And, you know, as, as, as we jump into this, I, I, I think I want to jump into it by looking at several things. One of them is there are events in human history that do not just shape uh, those moments within within the timeline, that they can go, you know, well beyond that scope. But there are some of them, and, and, and in particular, Genesis 3, Genesis 6, and Genesis 9, mm -hmm. that stretch from the beginning. God told us that he would tell us the end from the beginning, and he reveals in his words events that we're going to see unfolding in the end days. And Douglas, your your new book, Corrupting the Image, number two, uh, has, has done a wonderful, wonderful job of that. In fact, um, one of the things that has really blessed me is the amount of time that you take uh, unearthing things in extra biblical curriculum that those that heard the words, whether it was in Moses' day or in Jesus' day when he said, as in the days of Noah, they understood that we have lost that meaning today. Mm -hmm. And you really have done an outstanding job of Thank going you. through both not only history, but archaeological things to bring us back up to speed, uh, especially since this stuff is unfolding faster than we can even begin comprehending. Oh, so true. It is happening very quickly. And, um, you know, one of the things that really was driving me is I was trying to understand, you know, obviously Satan's called the dragon. But why is he called the dragon, right? Why is he called the great dragon? And this woman that rides the beast, I mean, that's kind of weird, right? And and so I, I really want to understand from the end times perspective, as as uh, we see in Revelation, like where did we get this particular imagery? Was God just giving John some strange things? And he's like, oh, okay, that'll that'll make him think, you know, or or was there something more to that? And I feel like we can get back to that bedrock of interpretation of where these things started, then we can really start to, you know, build upon that foundation to get a better sense of who the players are, what the end game is, and, you know, what we can ultimately expect. You know, and I, I think to bring that to clarity, and then I'm going to let uh, Dr. Spalding jump in. Uh, I've, I've, this last probably six months or so, I've been reading through uh, several different academic commentaries on the book of Revelation and the new international commentary, one of the things that really kind of jumped out on the pages at me is he said, those that originally read the writings of John knew exactly what he was talking mm -hmm. about. And it's like, they may have known, but we don't have a clue today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's so true. Right. And, and isn't yeah. that a part of the, of the, the, the process of interpreting scripture? is to regaining the knowledge and the ears that the original church had when we read the when we read the books of the new testament mm -hmm. yeah that that is and uh you know it unfortunately it's challenging because we have to 
we got to do a lot of spade work to, to kind of figure out what they were talking about and, and what it really meant. Um, you know, you know, sometimes we come up with, uh, you know, the woman that rides the beast is New York City or the Vatican. And it's like, well, those might be part of the problem, but I don't think those are in and of themselves the thing that God was talking about in the book of Revelation. John certainly wouldn't have understood New York City, you know, so it's got to be something else. <laughs> he wouldn't have understood an iPhone, so. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, gentlemen and, and Doug, uh, you and I have never met personally, um, but I, I want to commend you for for this this work, and and I want to tell those who've joined us today for this conversation that you need to first of all get the book, get the book, and here's why. Um, this is a researcher's dream right here because Doug's done the hard work already. And this book's very timely for me personally, Doug. So, and let me tell you why. I'm teaching through, and you and I have similar background. I'm a Calvary Chapel pastor. And so mm -hmm. we do book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, line upon line, precept upon precept. I'm teaching on Sunday mornings through the book of Revelation. Mm. And I'm teaching on Wednesday nights through the book of Ezekiel. And as I'm turning through the pages of your book, I'm thinking, <laughs> ah, well, this is fantastic information. And it will go right in line with what people need to know today. So so first of all, thank you for writing this. It's yeah. it's going to go. My most coveted position in on my bookshelves is right here behind the chair with arm's reach. So I can just <laughs> That's grab, great. Arm, grab it off the shelf <laughs> without uh -huh. wasting any effort. So <laughs> Very this cool. will be right there on books that i'll be using a lot so thank you very much for writing well, thank you i'm honored <laughs> that's great that's awesome yeah yeah it's really a bible class in itself which is it's just phenomenal so many people seem to skirt over things and and uh, throw it in there like everybody knows from the wells from which you're drawing and mm. you really take the time to give them the wells and help them understand thank you i appreciate that gentlemen that's very kind of you thank you and, you yeah. know, with, with that said, you know, is, is you know, where is Lucifer or in, in, in the ancient world is, is, is really his claims from what we understand in the Bible. Do we actually see him in the ancient world? You know, that's the really weird thing. I mean, the Bible talks very clearly about Satan, Lucifer, and yet we hear nothing of this particular entity in any of the ancient Greek literature or the ancient Mesopotamian literature, it's completely absent, right? So it's either the Bible's fiction, which, you know, I'm not really keen on that idea, or maybe we're missing something. And it was a paper written by Dr. Gallagher who um, really started helping me see the big picture, which is Isaiah 14, right? So talking about, oh, Lucifer, son of the morning, um, he he went back and he looked at that word in Hebrew, Hillel. It's a hapax legomenon. That means that it's a word that appears once in scripture. And he showed that Hillel uh, is not Lucifer, but it's actually Enlil in Sumerian and Elil in the Akkadian. And I tell you, once he made that connection, my mind was just blown, right? I'm like, oh my goodness, that's crazy, right? Because suddenly there's a connection from the Bible to ancient Near East, where we can say, okay, if this is a one for one, now we understand who this entity is, and we find him all over the place. And he goes by, I don't know how, I didn't do the, the math, like how many names, but it's a lot, right? He's got so many names, all these aliases. And the reality is that he was very well hidden, right? He, he's there, but in disguise, you know, and you're not going to find him as lucifer you'll never find anywhere in any ancient literature the term Lu lucifer because it's just not there because that is really a misnomer and you know i know it's too late people call him lucifer and you know i i don't i don't throw stones at them for doing that but just understand that 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 really from eos photos is which the the Sub septuagint translators were, were dealing with they, they threw that in son of the dawn and it, it's just not it's not the right or it's the bearer of the dawn. Um, so it's just, it's not the actual meaning of the name and really Enlil. So Enlil, what's interesting about that is that he was the God of the air, right? He was the God of the atmosphere of the air. And Paul says something like, 
you know, Satan, who is the prince of the power of the air, right? So that idea of it being Satan is already attested in the New Testament. Speaking of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, one of the things that I was trying to discover is why is he called the great dragon? You know, we, we know he's called the great dragon because it says very clearly, you know, Satan, the dragon, the serpent, the, you know, the dragon of old, all that. It's like, but why is he called the great dragon? And he's even called a, a red dragon, a fiery red dragon, right? So as I started going back and looking at the different epithets or, or syncretisms, uh, which are just aliases of Satan or Enlil, I, I found that he is the dragon, right? He, he's actually depicted as a fiery red dragon. If you go uh, to the, um, the East Berlin uh, Ancient Museum, you'll find the, uh, the Ishtar Gate there. And on the walls of the Ishtar Gate is a fire red dragon, right? It's called the Mushkushu. And that was one of the symbols of Enlil. Now, a few was removed. So by that time, it was maybe Marduk. But Marduk was another iteration of Enlil, right? So it, it, it again, it's blew my mind how many times we go back. And in fact, in, in Sumerian, he was called the Ushumgalu, which was the great dragon. I mean, it's just right on the nose, right? It's not like we have to kind of try to, to fit it in. It's it's right there. These are the epithets that he was going by. And and just by having that one connection that Enlil is Hillel from Isaiah 14, 12, it opens this whole world and we can see what he was doing. And the parallels don't stop there, right? Because Enlil never claimed to be the creator God. Rather, rather boastfully, he claimed to be the usurper God. And and they they have this thing called the Akitu Festival, which is where the good news, that's the term that they use, the good news, Surat Salmi, that was brought to Enlil that the creator God had been slain, right? So they would bring this to Enlil, hey, the creator God is slain. His name was Anu. He was the God of heaven. And he's been done away with. And this was something to celebrate. And so the, uh, the Anu ship, the... Um, the authority that Anu had, the creator God, then passed to Enlil, and then Enlil could give that, he would take the Anu ship, and then he would give his Enlil ship to whoever he wanted. And he gave it to Ninurta, who was also known as the son of Enlil, and Ninurta is Nimrod, all right? Well, maybe get to that a little bit later, but, but I was like, oh my goodness, this is crazy, you know? Like, there's so many connections when you just start putting it together that, you know, again, my mind was blown the whole time I was going through this this research, you know, but, um, you know, because the dragon is going to give the beast his authority and his power, right? And, um, you know, so his power throne and his, his authority, he will give those to the beast. And that's exactly what Enlil did, is he gave the Tablet of Destinies to Ninurta or Nimrod, so that then he could be the agent that he would work through in the ancient world. So, you know, needless to say, that kind of blew my mind. Um, the parallels are there. You see it in the iconography. You see that he's a great red dragon. He's called the great dragon uh, and so many different things. And, and then there was one of the various iterations of, of Enlil was also known as the Bashmu, right? So that was the Akkadian word uh, for the... Um, for the other Sumerian words, right? So in Sumerian, you have Ushumgalu, Mushhushu, and in Akkadian, you have Bashmu. And again, blew my mind because Bashmu in Hebrew comes out as Bashan, right? And we remember a certain giant from the area of Bashan, right? Og of Bashan. And, you know, it's like, wow, there, there's really something to this. And then that'll take us... Um, to the, some of the things that Jesus was doing in his ministry, where you know he took his disciples to uh, Caesarea Philippi, to the gates of Hades, right? So it's all in there, but I don't want to get too far ahead because there's lots of lots of cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. And as a Bible <laughs> teacher, Doug, I have to tell you, I've, I'm always looking for the application and the implication. Yeah. What does this information mean? How can we use it in in ministry to to equip? people for the days mm. that we live in today and i and i have to tell you that that understanding this and the connection uh, uh 
Satan was hiding in plain sight, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Through all of these different names and in all of these different cultures, it it helps us, I believe, it helps us to address the the narrative that's that's out there that well, you Christians really have this upside down because Lucifer he he's the good God he is he is the one that's bringing us enlightenment and 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 yeah. This research shows and it brings that common thread to today that we can say, no, wait, listen, let's look at the actual documents and we can document this and show you the history and the timeline that completely destroys that narrative today. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, obviously, uh, you know, as Christians, we have faith, right? And and that's a, a major part of uh, what we do. This whole thing is called faith. But I think sometimes people get the impression that we're supposed to have a blind faith. And I really don't see that as being the case. Our faith is based in historicity. Obviously, it's based in the God of Israel, right? But how do we know that that God exists, right? I don't have uh, neon signs, you know, coming to God from God to me every day, you know? So I need to understand and have confidence in his word and understanding that the things that are spoken of in his word are also attested in the ancient world, that underscores my confidence in the Bible. And I start to build this really broad foundation, right? So that I know that the, the historical matters, not even matters of faith, quote unquote, but just historical matters spoken of in the Bible are well-established, they're corroborated, and so that gives me even greater confidence uh, that the things, you know, when God then goes and tells me to do something scary, I'm like, okay, I can do that because I I know that this God that I worship, first of all, that he's real, the things that he said it are real. Um, you know, it's, it's the things that we have recorded in the Bible are not just fantasy. This is not the book of Mormon that was just made up out of whole cloth, out of thin air, but, but this is stuff that's based in reality. Uh, and we have lots of uh, attestation to it. So that really helps me. And, and then understanding that that the battle is real, right? That this battle is not something that started with Jesus, you know, then su Satan just suddenly came on the scene out of nowhere. I, I have heard this from people that, well, you know, why wasn't Satan really doing things before? He was. He just wasn't always going by the name Satan and certainly not by Lucifer, but he had many names and we find those all over the place, right? I mean, when you have the god Molech and Baal and Ashtoreth and all these these various names, um, I don't think Ashtoreth is actually Satan, but I, I would suggest that that Molech and Baal and all those they're they're essentially one and the same guy, right? They're all worshiping Satan in one form or another, and, and they're just different. They're the variations on a theme. That's all we have. So Satan was being worshipped all over the place. It's really what I would, you know, tell people. And, it, it, you know, this is kind of a study of Satan in a way, but it's, it's, you have to understand, you know, like anytime you write a story, you have to spend a good amount of time on your, on your, um, um, on the bad guy, right? You, good bad guys make really exciting good guys, okay? <laughs> because now you have something to overcome. And it's not that the Bible is merely a story, but it is a story, right? And we're we're just ha we happen to be living inside of that story, and there is this huge drama that's playing out, this huge battle. And when, when we can understand that the battle has been raging, uh, it's not only in the pages of Scripture. The truth of the battle is given to us in the pages of Scripture, but the enemy's perspective, uh, we can get that from the pages outside Scripture, and gives us just kind of a you know, helps us understand what this battle has been looking like for thousands of years. You know, one of the things that really uh, blessed me in, in reading through your book is this connection you have made to where who Lucifer really is, and uh, which puts him at ground zero in Genesis 6 as not, mm. not simply sending agents we call the watchers uh, mm. to facilitate, you know, genetic manipulation, all the things that were going on down there, but he had direct hands-on 
involvement, mm. uh, which for me is a great, it was really a game changer for understanding not only that dynamic, but where we are and what's going on today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was something that, you know, I kind of stumbled upon that, to be honest. Um, you know, I, I, I've often wondered, you know, where was Satan in Genesis 6, right? And so when the the sons of God became uh, numerous, daughters were born of them, and the sons of God came and they took any that they chose, right? That I think a lot of us are quite familiar with that whole scenario there in Genesis chapter 6. But we don't see Satan involved in that. And it seems like if he's the head honcho, we would expect to find him involved in this thing. And um, as I was I was doing research on uh, Mount Hermon, I came across, I kept coming across this, um, this inscription, talking about this inscription that had been found up there. And I, I traced it to George Nicholsburg out of Harvard University. And, you know, I kept finding his translation, but I'm like, I'm a little skeptical. I want to see it for myself, right? And so I was able to track this thing down on the British Museum's website. And their translation didn't match up with his translation. In fact, they left out uh, words uh, four, seven, and nine, I, I think it is. Um, so they left out 33% of the words. They just didn't translate them. And the others they amended. And then I, I was able to look at Dr. Nicholsburg translation and i agreed with most of it but there were two words i was like wait it just doesn't make sense he he translated them it says according to the great god the great and holy god those taking an oath from here uh taking an oath proceed from here and i was like okay that that sounds pretty legit and he 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 correctly associated it with the book of enoch where you have the 200 angels that came down and he's saying, look, this is the this is the uh, the oath that these angels took. They they put uh, took this execration where they're saying, you know, may I be cursed if I don't fulfill this? And we're doing it according to the great and holy God. It was the and holy that kept kept throwing me off because I'm like, wait a second, it wasn't the holy God that told you to do this thing, right? It wasn't the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who was telling you, telling these angels to come down and mate with women. In fact, that was a big no-no, right? And if you look in the book of Enoch, it actually talks about how the holy God said, you know, because of this crime that you've committed, you're going to be now be punished. So I was like, something is not right. And so I kept looking at, at two words in particular. One I, I was able to figure out, I think it's just a prefix. It's the word bow, and it means ox or cattle. Uh, but the other one, I could not find it, no matter how many lexicons and websites and scholarly articles I searched. It was this word batios or, or, or batiu in the, in the genitive. And I was like, it's just not Greek. I mean, that's, you know, that that's the, the conclusion I finally came to. It's not Greek. And um, I the only other place that I found it so there's two places in the whole world that you can find this word. One is on that inscription found on top of Mount Hermon. The other is in a little grotto, a little cave in southern Italy, the Grotto Porcinara, um, that was frequented by sailors. In fact, you couldn't even get to it by foot, probably. You had to get there by boat. So it was written by sailors for sailors. I'm like, now this doesn't make any sense at all. Why would we have this very peculiar word in only two places in the entire world, separated, you know, by the Mediterranean Sea? You know, it didn't make any sense. But then, as again, I kept putting the pieces together. Um, what people who specialize in Mesapian, that's the the culture and language of that that era, they're saying, well, this seems to be a an epithet for Zeus, right? It's, it's very closely related with Zeus. But to have a local epithet. To, in other words, to have a local name, that means you have to have a place. It's kind of like, you know, the Denver Broncos, right? You can't have the Broncos without Denver. You've got to have Denver to have the Denver Broncos, right? I, I think that, I hope that makes sense. So in order in order to have Zeus uh, Batas or Zeus Batios, you have to have a Batios in the area for it to be a local epithet. And I was, you know, looking at the map and I'm like, there's no place called Batios in southern Italy. 
it's just not there. So once I was able to rule that out, uh, I kept looking in the literature and people were saying, well, you know, yeah, these were this, these inscriptions talking about Zeus Batios all over the place is, um, you know, it, it, it was written by sailors for sailors and these sailors were Semitic speaking. I was like, oh, Semitic speaking. OK, so between the 8th century till about maybe the 3rd century, you have these Semitic speaking sailors. And I'm like, well, who in the ancient world were Semitic and were sailors? Well, Phoenicians, right? And guess what's in their back their backyard? Mount Hermon. I was like, oh, OK, so then it started making sense. So then I was like, so the word came from the area of. Of uh, Mount Hermon coming into Italy, but again, this is a very strange thing. Why would they take this word? Well, I, I consulted a guy uh, named Dr. Amar Anos. He's a professor in Finland and he was explaining. He, he pointed me to this really cool article showing that there's a word uh, in Latin. The word is haruspex. And the last part of it is, you know, specs, it means to see, to, to view something. But the first word, har, nobody could figure out until a scholar came along and he realized that the word har is actually the Sumerian word for liver. And it turns out that there was an ancient profession that was known as a liver viewer, okay? And, you know, you, you would look at livers for a living. This was part of the occult. And the, the whole idea is that they would take you know, uh, a goat or a sheep or something, take the liver, slice it in half, and then they would look at it. And this was a way to uh, read good omens or maybe bad omens, and they could kind of tell the future. So the theory went, right? I don't think they actually could, but that's what they were purporting. So you had this word that was coming from Sumerian, and it, it would just became normalized in both Greek and Latin. And, and that was really that missing element that I needed to understand because uh, I was putting forth a theory and I was, you know, a little bit tentative about this. Um, so I was, you know, consulting with uh, with Professor Amar Anas and. Uh, you know, I'm like, I, I'm wondering if this word batios, could it be related to the word bad in Sumerian? And he's like, I, I think you're on to something, right? And so we had this whole discussion. So let me back up. So we talked about Enlil, all right? So Enlil, uh, his, his, one of his major symbols, and these are called logograms, all right? And I don't wanna geek out on people too much here, but just so you understand that when you write Sumerian, it kind of looks like chicken scratch, right? They would take a reed, they would press it into soft clay, and they would kind of make these triangle looking symbols and that it was called a syllabary. Anyway, there was one for, for Enlil, and it was the, the name of the symbol is B-A-D, bad, or bad. <laughs> it's quite ironic, right? And what does it mean? It means death. I was like, no, that's crazy, right? And the way you pronounce the word is very different than the name of the symbol. So uh, the, the way you pronounce this is oog, but the, the name of the symbol was bad. And so again, after doing these various consultations, I was able to stitch together that this word on this inscription found on top of Mount Hermon is the word bad plus the eos ending, which makes it into uh, it, it, it Hellenizes it, it normalizes it into into Greek, so that it becomes a a, a people name, a Semitic people name, um, and so so bad or batios is talking about Enlil. And I was like, oh my goodness, there it is. And that word means death. And Satan has the power of death. He's known as the, the king of death. He's the god of the underworld, all these different things. And so being able to discover these things, um, what I found is that it was Satan. It wasn't by the command of the great and holy God. Rather, it was by command of the greatness personified uh, bull god Batios, or Satan, the god of death, who gave the command for those 200 angels to go out. And, and just one more thing is that a lot of the scribes understood that Dagon and Enlil were the same guy and that they shared the same logogram. So they would often use that one logogram of 
of Bad to represent all these different names for the same entity. And, you know, so there you have it. It's like, it was astounding and quite exciting, but <laughs> really hard work, you know, lots of midnight oil to kind of, to put all this together. But, you know, the result is like, wow, this is so cool that we have, uh, we have, um, you know, extra biblical uh, written evidence that Satan was the one who gave the command to those angels to go and do what they did. And so he was very much involved. But of course, Satan's a schemer and he's, I think he's, he's, he's totally a sly fox. And what he does is he's, you know, what did he do with Eve? Hey, did God really say, you know? And so, you know, Adam and Eve, then they pulled the proverbial trigger on the gun. Satan, he's like, I didn't do anything. You know, you don't see my prints on that gun, do you? And I think he did the same thing with these 200 angels. He was like, hey, it might be a good idea to go down and uh, get started making uh, a hybrid race. You know, I won't personally get involved, right? Because then I won't get in trouble, but you will. You know, and I think that's that's what he's so good at, unfortunately. Yes, absolutely. Well, <laughs> you just saved everyone a whole bunch of work, Doug. He explained that in those in those few minutes saved us all a ton of work tying that together that was a beautiful explanation I, I appreciate that so satan is the slanderer the accuser of the brethren the scripture says mm. he's also a slanderer of of yahweh wasn't mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh he actually is you actually yeah. bring that out in the book that 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 satan is slandered was going around to all of his peers and and slandering really deceiving those and that was preemptive to the rebellion right yeah and, and that's coming out of uh ezekiel 28 and you know again i was i was looking at this stuff and i it's when i took a, a double look right because it talks about the king of tyre and i was like wait the king of tyre why it's not just a regular human. This guy, he was in Eden. He's called the anointed cherub who covers. He was on the holy mountain of God. He was in the midst of fiery stones. This is not your normal human, right? But why was he called the king of Tyre? So as I started looking into that, the king of Tyre was an epithet for Melkart, all right? So Melek Karat, which means king of the city. City being a reference, not necessarily to Tyre, but it, it's a reference to the underworld. Sometimes the underworld was called the city, right? So uh, Melkart was yet one more iteration of Satan. Again, blew my mind. And there's all kinds of connections that I won't get into. And, and so once I understood that, I was like, oh my goodness, this is yet one more perspective of who Satan was and what he was what he was doing. And as you go through Ezekiel 28, starting at verse 12, he says that you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. It says you were in Eden, the garden of God. All these precious stones were your covering, right? So God made Satan perfect. He made him full of wisdom. He's got absolute beauty. He is definitely the cat's meow, okay? I mean, this guy is la creme de la creme. And um, and he he sets him up as a type of priest and all these things and he's anointed cherub and all this different stuff right and then it says you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you and then we get to this rather strange thing by the abundance of your trading you became filled with violence within and you sinned and so I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God and I destroyed you oh covering cherub from the midst of the fiery stones. So I was like, wait, you know, everything, it makes sense. You have Satan as the anointed cherub. He is the one that God established in an incredible way, second to none in God's creation. But then it says the abundance of your trading. And that really, you know, kind of threw me for a while. And, and once I, um, you know, I took a look at, at the Hebrew there, and the word there is rehulatcha. Right, so this word uh, it, it can mean a couple different things. First of all, it's related linguistically, uh, as far as the root goes, it's related to the word regel, which is your foot. Um, but but the word that's used, it's talking about slander, right? 
and the the basic meaning at, at the most basic fundamental level of this word is something to go back and forth and to make an exchange all right so could it be trading yes it could be trading i want to make that clear however we find that the same root uh resh kaf lamet that same root is used in the word rakil and a rakil is a slanderer right so you know, somebody who goes back and forth and exchanges things. Well, traders do that, but so do gossips. So do people who are, you know, spreading rumors and slanderers. They're going about spreading things back and forth. And I was like, oh, wow, that really fits the bill. In fact, when you look at the word slander, if you, if you look at slanderer in Greek, what is the word? diavolos right diavolos or the devil i was like no way that's crazy right so the slanderer is is just an amazing description of who satan is like that's what he does and you might say well, well when did he slander well he certainly slandered in the garden right because he said has god really said if you are charged as God's number one guy and God stationed Satan in the garden to oversee that place. And then he goes to these newly minted humans and he says, can you really trust God? No, he doesn't say you can't trust God, but he says, can you really trust God? What, what else was he doing? He was slandering God. He was calling into question God's credibility his faithfulness, his truthfulness. I mean, that is slander of the worst kind. And chances are he, he did that with, with some of the, the, the angels as well. That's a whole other story, but he is the slanderer. That fits his description point blank. And that's what we have in Greek describing who he is, that he is the devil, the slanderer, right? So, um, yeah, and, and you know what that did for me, and Mike, you were asking about, you know, how do we apply this? Because uh, I'm a pastor as well, right? And and I I asked that same question, how do we apply this? And it drove home for me the severity, the 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 gravity of how ugly slander is. And you know, for me personally, and and those you know in my flock, you know, and I'm a sheep too. Like I just, you know, I encourage us. I'm like, guys, let's be careful that we don't slander people. And that may be that we just keep our mouth shut sometimes. Maybe we don't say anything at all. If it's between talking and slandering, maybe, or you know, not talking, let's just not talk. All right. There, there's a time to present evidence, and there's a time, you know, for everything under the sun. But a lot of times we're just slandering people, and I don't want to be guilty of that. Amen. You know, I look at what's going on in the world today and and cancer culture and all the crazy things the left are doing and character assassination is, is one of the things that they use. And now we know, you know, I think when the iniquity force in a sense is an ascendancy and right now, uh, I mean, Satan's made, making some major moves. You're going to see his children begin manifesting his characteristics. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, and, and again, what it, it drove home for me is that, you know, people can slander on every side of the aisle. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I want to be careful, right? Because I may disagree with somebody politically, but I don't know their heart. I can see their fruit, but I don't know their heart. And so I want to be just careful to let God be the judge and let him do what he does, right? And, and so, you know, I think it's it's fine when we call out various um uh, you know the fruit like right? the fruit that i'm looking at is ugly fruit right and i'll let god be the judge of the character and all that so and, yeah you know, as well as being in ministry you know that sometimes the slander can come in the form of a prayer request <laughs> yes it can <laughs> if you hear about brother so-and-so pray for him he's really struggling right now <laughs> yeah that is so true that's so true and sometimes facebook is just riddled with you know, people making all kinds of unsubstantiated claims. And, you know, I mean, we're, we're all looking toward, you know, we're, we think we're pretty close to the end times and we're looking forward to the return of Jesus. And we're on edge that, you know, Satan and the beast and all this stuff is coming. But 
I'm not God, you know, so I've got to be very careful and I want to use my words wisely and not fall into the same trap that that Satan fell into of slandering various people. You know, I, I look at social media, it's nothing more than a psyop. And it, it was not only to learn new ways of controlling us, uh, but new ways of bringing out the worst in us. Mm, boy, if that isn't true. Yeah. Ugh, yeah. It, it sure does. <laughs> it does a really great job at that. Now, let's see if we can kind of work our way from social media back to the book. Uh, <laughs> uh, there are, I mean, there's a lot of great things you cover. And one of them is, you know, okay, so Saint was behind uh, the Watchers coming, the Nephilim before the flood. And I mean, when you really get into, uh, they were basically the rulers of the earth prior to the flood. And, mm -hmm. you know, I kind of looked at what Nimrod was doing. It was the first attempt to create the new Atlantis, if you will. But with, with all that said, how did Satan uh, perpetuate Nephilim after the flood? Yeah, so after his amazing scheme, which was had a success rate of 99.999%, .999%, mind you, only eight people made it out alive. Uh, after all that went down, down the drain, um, Satan started again. And that's where we find... In Genesis 11, it says that uh, that um, or Genesis 10, excuse me, that that Nimrod, who was born of human parents, mind you, says that he became a Gibor. So I want to stress that the word Gibor, it means hero and it is used of Nephilim, but it's not always used of Nephilim. David had Giborim. He had mighty men and I don't think they were Nephilim as far as I can tell. So. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that, but it can certainly be used in that context. And when we look at the Septuagint of Genesis 10, it, they say that that Nimrod be, uh, became a uh, a gigas, right? And a gigas is a giant. That is someone who is very much a hybrid between a human and a a god, as it were, one of the titans, right? So you start looking in the literature and you're like, oh my goodness, you know, Nimrod, uh, whose name means let's rebel, uh, he was known as a hybrid. And again, what blew me away is looking at some of the, you know, secular uh, ancient Near Eastern scholars, they, uh, and this isn't me, they have associated Nimrod with Ninurta. And I was like, okay, that's pretty interesting, right? So Ninurta, I was talking about before. Um, so, you know, he's one of the gods of the ancient world, but he, he's not a lesser god. He's a major god, and he's considered to be the son of Enlil. And what did Enlil give him? The Tablet of Destinies. And whoever has the Tablet of Destinies is the one who controls the planet. Now, we might say, well, that's just, you know, that's just all mythology. Well, in a way, yes. However, this idea of the Tablet of Destinies, uh, it, it sounds, of course, very foreign to us because we don't have such a thing. But let's fast forward really quick to Revelation chapter 5. In Revelation chapter 5, there the Father is, is sitting on his throne and at his right hand is a scroll that's written on the inside and the outside, and it's sealed with seven seals. And it says that nobody was found worthy in heaven or on earth or under the earth to open, to take the scroll and to open its seals. And John starts to weep. Oh man, this is really a bummer, right? And then one of the elders comes and says, don't weep. The lion of the tribe of Judah has overcome. And then he looks over and what does he see? A lamb as if it's been slain, right? And then people start singing, you know, you're worthy to take the scroll and to uh, release its seals because you were slain. Well, what's up with that, right? And, and what is this scroll? I argue that the scroll is the same thing as a tablet of destinies, that they're they're one and the same thing. Now, uh, whether or not there really exists this particular scroll, I mean, I think there is because we see it in the Father's right hand. Um, and, and whether Satan was holding on to that thing or if this is a an abstraction of this idea, but it really doesn't matter because what he had what satan had was authority over the planet when when jesus is being tempted the last temptation he takes him up on mount herman mind you and he says uh you know i'm going to paraphrase is like look i know you came to save the world and all um and, you know you came to 
take mankind back. That's fine. You know, I'll give it to you. Right. Just bow down to me and I'll give you the world because all these kingdoms have been delivered to me and I can give it to whoever I want. And Satan or, and Jesus doesn't challenge him. He's like, come on, that's ridiculous. I mean, what are you talking about? Jesus takes it as as a fact, like, yes. And he talks about Satan being the king of this world, the God of this world and all that, all that. So I think that Satan really did have the tablet of destinies or he had authority over the planet. How did he get it? Well, uh, God makes the world. He then uh, creates a, a lease type of scenario where he gives it to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve basically give the keys over to Satan. And to get those keys back, God can't just say, give me those keys because it's a legal right. He has legal right or had legal right to the planet because Adam, who got it from God, forfeited the opportunity, forfeited the right, and he um, rather foolishly gave it away and gave it to Satan. So Jesus had to come. Uh, he did many things at the cross. Let me make that clear. But one of the major things is that he purchased back the planet itself and mankind, right? Um, and and this kind of just puts a, a whole new uh, angle on this thing. Wow, like, I know he died for my sins, but he did so much more, you know? Like, he really had to accomplish a lot of things at the cross. And, you know, so he he takes back this authority that Satan had, had ripped out of uh, Adam's hands or Adam kind of gave it over and Jesus purchased that back. So the tablet of destinies, and that is what Ninurta held is he was holding the tablet of destiny. So getting back to Nimrod is so Nimrod, Ninurta, the same guy, Satan, again, we know he's going to give the beast his power throne and his great authority. He did that already. And remember that we're expecting a beast who was, is not, and will ascend out of the abyss. Well, uh, Nimrod or Ninurta fits the bill 100% of the beast that was, is not, and will ascend out of the abyss. And Satan, his dad, already gave him that authority in the ancient world. And we're going to see him do it again in, in, uh, in Revelation. So, you know, it, it's amazing how they all fit together. Yeah, you know, one of the things that really exploded to me in the chapter that you dealt with that in, uh, I didn't I didn't know about the tablets of destiny, okay? But in, in, in the uh, academic commentaries that I'm reading, they call the scroll that you're talking about in, in Revelation, they call it the scroll of destiny. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so, <laughs> but, uh, Isn't that crazy? Yeah. yeah. I, I think you're right. I think that is that may be the keys of death, hell, and the grave, and all that is associated with that scroll. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of like you know whether we would call it the title deed to planet Earth or whatever you want to call. It. I mean, there, there's different designations for that, but but it was the authority because whoever held the tablet of destinies had authority over mankind and had the um, the prerogative to decree fates. All right. So this was a big deal. And, you know, I really believe, based on all this research, that Satan had absolute authority over mankind, and he had legal right to it. And that was something that was very powerful as I was discovering this, is that, you know, sometimes we hear people say, well, you know, God is all powerful. Yes, he is. And God could just snap his fingers and do away with the devil. Or sometimes skeptics say, well, why didn't Jesus just die immediately right after Adam and Eve you know, did their foolish thing because it doesn't work that way. Satan's not a fool, right? From his perspective, he's trying to perpetuate his kingdom forever. And once he was able to, to, um, you know, to, to scam Adam and Eve, uh, sort of fair and square, if you will, um, you know, once he had that legal authority, he was not going to give it up. And it wasn't God coming in with guns blazing or let's arm wrestle for it or whoever has the bigger army. It had nothing to do with that. This is a battle of lawyers, not a battle of might. That's what's so amazing about it. And I think that's part of Satan's genius is that like he's not stupid. He knows God is all powerful, right? He's not like, oh, I bet I could take God. It wasn't that at all. 
<laughs> he was like, God is foolish because he gave the authority to Adam and Eve, and I could take that away like taking candy from a baby. And so he did, right? And so he gets this, and because he knows that God is righteous and God is truthful and God cannot tell a lie, you might say Satan is the one more than anybody who is standing on the promises of God. Because he's like, what you said you must do, I am absolutely counting on you to be truthful and faithful and righteous and just, and you will do what you said you're going to do, or you're just like me. You're no better than me. And I think he would love to see that, but he probably doesn't expect that. So, you know, as long as he had that legal authority, he kind of had God over a barrel in a sense, right? God worked it out, of course, but from Satan's mindset, he's like, I'm, I'm untouchable. And that's why he could have the Akitu festival where he, where the good news would be brought to him all in a, kind of a mockery uh, stage setting of, of saying that the creator God was right. Uh, you know, so that's very much a curiosity. Like why didn't Enlil say, well, I'm the creator God. Cause he's like, I don't need to, I usurped the creator God. In fact, I'm proud of the fact that I'm not the creator and I was able to steal it from him. And I'm going to cherish that and celebrate that and brag about that. I didn't create the world, Anu did, you know, but guess what? I, I dealt with him. And so now I'm the guy that you've got to talk to. If you want something done, you talk to me or you can talk to my son Ninurta, who I have empowered to be my agent on the earth. And then he will do that bidding, right? So again, getting back to Nimrod, so after the flood, what does Satan do? Well, <clears throat> he's, he's not going to try the same scheme because that, of course, didn't work. So now he picks somebody, this guy, Nimrod, the rebel, and, you know, he essentially makes a deal with him. So, look, you know, um, I'm going to empower you. You're going to become a god, uh, and people will talk about you for generations. In fact, we're still talking about him. Whenever we talk about Hercules or Heracles or any variation on that, Hercules theme, we're talking about Nimrod, right? And so I talked earlier about uh, uh, Melkart, right? So the king of Tyre. There, there's a, a bilingual inscription that was found in Malta that uh, has Melkart on the Phoenician side and it has Heracles or Hercules on the Greek side, right? So there we have a one-for-one -one, um, uh, correlation between these two. And Melkart, uh, was was simply a um, just one more uh, syncretism of the ancient god Ninurta, and of course Ninurta is with Enlil, right? And and so what I think happened in the ancient world is that in a way that's akin to how the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, that Satan overshadowed Nimrod. Not exactly the same because he's not the Holy Spirit, but in a way that's similar to it. And what's really interesting is there's a guy from Reno, Nevada, who had leukemia and he needed to uh, get a bone marrow transplant. And so there was this forensics, forensics lab that was kind of following his story. And they took sample of, samples of his DNA before he got the, the transplant and then after. And they started seeing that the donor's DNA started showing up in his blood and then after, I don't know, a couple of years, they, they looked at his, his sperm <laughs> and lo and behold, his sperm was not his own. It not, did not have his DNA, but that of his donor. That blew me away. Uh, I was like, wow, that is crazy, right? So what that, what that shows us is that if you could have this kind of overshadowing experience or to put it in, in you know, little flashier terms, it, it's a quantum entanglement is what's happening, right? So these two beings are becoming entangled so that they share a destiny. And and Satan was able to, you know, he, in, in, uh, looking at some of these different ideas, this process is not so far-fetched that Satan could in a way overshadow him and then change his DNA so that it becomes Satan's DNA. And when we go back to Genesis 3.15, and I talk about that a lot in this book, Corrupting Image Volume 1, I talk a lot about the genetics of this whole thing. Uh, and I touch on it, of course, in, in book two, which is 
Um, Genesis 3.15, God said, uh, you know, after Satan uh, snookered uh, Adam, you know, he says, okay, because you've done this, he's speaking to Satan. He says, there will I mean, be enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed. Uh, you will strike his heel and he will crush your head. So that prophecy, I think, was like a prophecy of doom over Satan's head. But what it shows us is that insofar as the woman has seed, and I go into all kinds of detail talking about that in, in book one, but it also tells us that Satan has seed. And that was really a mystery to me until I was able to understand looking at um, information theory is that information is a non-material entity that requires a physical medium. So it's a, a non material entity that requires a physical medium. So when we're looking at, at DNA, what is inside of DNA, right? Well, what's inside of chromosome? What, well, genes, what's inside of genes? Well, DNA, right? What's inside of DNA? Nucleic acids, A, G, T, and C. You have those four nucleic acids. Well, what's inside of those? Well, you know, nothing other except they're holding information. And inside of a seed is information and an information is a non-material entity that requires a physical medium and once i understood that i was like oh that is how you can have a spiritual entity that's not physical have information and then that information has to be stored somehow and so then satan who has seed according to god in genesis 3 15 he's able to impart his seed upon the person of his choosing and in the yeah. ancient world, that was Nimrod. And then to back up what you're saying, there's been a lot of research. And one of the things they have come up is that DNA is the most effective way of storing information that man has ever found. You know, he didn't create it, but he found it. And I mean, just the, the amount of information is, is absolutely mind boggling. Mm hmm. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, yeah, DNA is, is really fascinating stuff. And of course, that ties into uh, in, into what's coming in the end. And I'm talking all about that in, in Corrupting the Image Volume 3. But, you know, again, the beast that was, is not, and will ascend out of the abyss, right? Out of the realm of the dead, right? So, you, again, you see, keep seeing these different uh, connection points. There's so many... Uh, they're they're quite exciting and a little bit scary at the same time, you know. So I, I you know I don't I don't necessarily think that Nimrod the man is going to come back to life, but I, what I would suggest is that Nimrod the avatar is going to return. Okay, and what I mean by that is just as Satan overshadowed Nimrod according to my understanding, so that. Nimrod, the person was still there. His his body, his shell was still there, but he he was then replaced from the inside out, if you will, with Satan, right? And so he became this living, breathing bio suit, this avatar that Satan could then operate in. And what's interesting is the beast is called the son of perdition. Who else was called the son of perdition? Judas, right? He was called the son of perdition. And what did Satan do with Judas? He personally possessed Judas. And just my speculation, but I think that if Satan had continued in that relationship, if he continued possessing him, it's, it's very possible, likely, that Judas would have become a beast. In other words, Satan dwelling inside of him and remaining there, and being in this, this uh, quantum entanglement entangled uh, relationship, this superposition or this overshadowing, uh, as we might want to call it, that that his DNA, that Judas's DNA would have uh, eventually changed to take on that of the donor. All right. And of course, that was cut short because Judas hanged himself. But in the in the uh, in the future, right, there will be someone known as the beast. And then Satan is going to overshadow him and then impart his DNA so that he becomes this avatar, and uh, and so that I believe will be the return of of Nimrod. You know, one of the things, and I uh, I just simply know this because of 
with, with the Biblical Life College and Seminary, I actually had uh, students that were active special forces. Mm. That, and, and then during freedom, when we went over there and we took Baghdad, uh, I, I actually had one of them call me on a sat phone, special forces <laughs> sitting on Saddam Hussein's throne. <clears throat> and he said, he said, Mike, he said, you wouldn't believe what we did first. He said, there is a ziggurat in Baghdad or right outside of Baghdad. He said, that was the first place that we secured. And he said, an archaeological team went in because they, there was a, a, a remains of a Nephilim there that they believed was Gilgamesh. Mm. Wow. That they brought out of it. And so, I mean, he, he brought to my attention that uh, a lot of, the, of what we call uh, top tier nations, Russia, China, America, that there is a arms race, not only for Nephilim DNA, but antediluvian technology. Mm. And maybe from the very core of this, uh, that we see uh, the transhumanist dream may be achieved by wow. infusing Nephilim DNA mm. to bring it, which you, you set it back into biblical context. You have the, the individual that becomes the beast, has this fatal wound, and so they used a special transugenic uh, recipe that they have created maybe from uh, Nephilim themselves, which could even be the body of Nimrod. Wow. That they that they infuse this person who becomes the son of person. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, in the book, I talk about Gilgamesh. Uh, his name actually means uh, the ancient hero, okay? And uh, so, you know, I'm not 100% sure that Gilgamesh is Nimrod, but from the literature that I was reading, there seems like there's a, a high likelihood that they could be one and the same person. And um, in the, the Louvre in France, there is a... Um, there's a relief of Gilgamesh, and he's 18 feet tall, okay? And he's holding a lion like a little chihuahua, right? <laughs> and it's like, wow, that's a big guy, right? I mean, that is just a huge, huge guy. You know, that puts him like 5,000 pounds, and um, I mean, just incredibly strong, right? And so I think it, I think it's very likely that, that Nimrod and Gilgamesh may have been the same guy. Um, but, you know, th again, the parallels are just all over the place when you start looking at at who this individual was and um you know he was known as the god of death and and let me just say that from 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 uh from sumeria um or from ancient sumer you know how does it get over to to the to the land of canaan well remember when god says to abraham know for certain that your descendants will be uh slaves and in the fourth generation, I'll bring them out because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. It's always one of those weird things. So when the children of Israel come into the land, who do they find? Well, they find the Amorites, but they're known by various different names. They're known as the Anakim, the Zamzumim, the Amim, right? The Rephaim, they're giants is what they are. But, but the general collective term is the Amorites. In fact, in Amos 2.9, God says, uh, yet it was I who destroyed the Amorites, whose height was like the height of the cedars. All right, so these are huge guys. But at the time that he's speaking to Abraham, he's saying that their iniquity is not yet complete. So it's in process. So how did this happen? Well, looking at who their God was, again, blew my mind. Their God, his name was Martu. Hmm, <laughs> that's really curious, isn't it, right? Martu sounds like Marduk. Um, you start tracing it back. Marduk and Nimrod, those are the same root letters, meaning rebel. Um, and, you know, the, the correlation you, you see is astounding. Also, uh, uh, Martu was associated with Enlil. They shared the same logogram, Bad which means the god of death, right? So we start seeing all these parallels once again. And then from that came Og, king of the Bashan, by the way. And um, I traced the name of, of Og back to Ug, which I already explained. Ug means death. And the symbol for that is Bad, which is Enlil, right? Once again, I mean, we just find it all over looking at some of the Ugaritic literature, we find that um, 
there was a deified dead king uh, who reigned on Mount Hermon. This was kind of like heaven and hell at the same place, right? This is uh, in, in the ancient literature that Mount Hermon was this terrible place where this god dwelt. And he also dwelt at Ashtoreth and Edre. Those are the two specific places that are mentioned in the book of Joshua as to where Og was from, Ashtoreth and Edre. And that is found in Ugaritic literature saying, yep, this is the guy, right? So, you know, I don't know if, if uh, King Og is Satan or was Satan or was the same as Nimrod. I, I can't make that connection, but they're definitely related. There's definitely a correlation between them. Uh, so what I would suggest is that, um, you know, Satan becomes this avatar and then he's able to pass on that DNA, whether it's just through procreating with women or whether it is uh, through some other genetic process, if he's able to impart that DNA to other humans so that they become giants, I, I don't know ultimately how he would have done that. But the trail is there, you know, and if maybe if somebody else, you know, can kind of pick up this research and, and take it further, that'd be awesome. But but we definitely see in, in the linguistics, we see this this paper trail that was left to show us that, that we're, we're dealing with uh, either the same entity or very, you know, very similar entities. You know, I think to bring this home with your book, well, I think one of the things it does is we, we see so much within the archaeological community and the scientific community try to discredit the word of God. But the more you actually dig into it, I, I think they're uh, it's like Derek Gilbert always says, they have the right information, but they always draw the wrong conclusions because their paradigm is incorrect. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think what you have done is, is to show how that all of the major text within, within that, that realm actually confirms the word of God and it, it should cause our faith to soar. And it, it adds so much to what Jesus did for us at the cross. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think part of, you know, when the apostle Paul said, you know, and, and the eons to come, he's going to, you know, show us all these wonderful things. And I, I, I think part of it is he's going to show various layers of what Jesus victory on the cross did for us. And our minds are going to be blown over and over and over again that we did not know the depth that mm. the cross the ultimate singularity in space time and it is the ultimate event that not only changed human history but bleeds right on over into eternity yep absolutely absolutely and <laughs> um you know in in psalm 22 you know psalm 22 Two, of course, is talking about the crucifixion of Jesus, and it's incredible detail, right? It talks about his bones are out of joint. They cast lots for his clothes. I mean, all these things happen. But then you get to verse 15, and there's this really weird thing. It says, and many bulls have surrounded me. The bulls of Bashan uh, gape at me with their mouths open like roaring lions. You're like, what is that talking about? I don't remember any bulls being at the cross, right? Uh, especially bulls of Bashan. But as I was looking at the, the literature, again, Bashan in Akkadian is Bashmu. Bashmu was another epithet for Satan, and it means a snake dragon. It's both snake and dragon, right? So there's, there's various various uh, themes of, of that. And then about 35 miles south of Mount Hermon and a little bit uh, east to northeast of the Sea of Galilee, we find what's called Gilgal Rephaim, and two thirds of a mile north of that, we find this huge geoglyph that has, it's a snake, right? It's a snake etched into the ground, <laughs> and it looks like the Bashmu, right? It looks like this snake dragon, and the whole area is known as Bashan. This is where Og is from. This is the area of the snake dragons. So. It's very curious that when Jesus comes to do his ministry, he doesn't go straight to Jerusalem. In fact, he barely goes to Jerusalem, right? Obviously, he dies and resurrects there, but that's not his headquarters. It's in the area of the Galilee. And it says that those dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. I mean, we're like, oh, Christ, it's Jesus. It's great. But it's not just metaphorical. It's not allegorical that they're dwelling in darkness. No, 
It actually says in Isaiah where that's taken from, that those dwelling in the shadow land of death, Tzalmavet, those dwelling in the shadow land of death have seen a great light. They were in the shadow land of death because they were right next door to Mount Hermon, which is where the angels came down on, on, on Hermon, right? And, uh, and this becomes the land of the snake dragons. So Jesus took the spiritual battle right to Satan's headquarters, and he was on the offense, not the defense, right? When, when they're crossing over the Sea of Galilee and this, this wind comes up out of nowhere and, and the guys are like, Master, don't you care? We're about to die, right? That wasn't just your ordinary storm. That was Satan and his forces trying to repel Jesus from coming into their camp, right? Because Jesus was going to their headquarters and, and, you know, he rebukes the wind. Like, what has the wind ever done to him? Why would he rebuke it? Because it was Satan who stirred up that wind. We see that in the book of Job where he has the wind come and it knocks down the house of Job's kids. That was, that wind was from Satan. So, you know, Jesus, of course, overcomes that. They get to the other side. And then this is like Satan's last offense, offensive, which is he has or maybe a defense, if you will, he has legion. This is a guy with at least 5,000 demons in him. And, and he just runs up to Jesus. He's like, oh boy, we're toast, right? And, and he just, he falls down before Jesus because he knows he has no fighting chance. And um, so, you know, that's like part one. But then, you know, sometime later, Jesus takes the disciples over to Caesarea Philippi which was also known as the gates of Hades. Now, according to the rabbis, you would never take your students there because it was like sin city, like seriously. And you did not want to go there, but Jesus takes his disciples there. Why would he do that? Why would a good rabbi take his disciples there? What can you possibly learn there? Well, he makes this statement that the gates of Hades will not prevail against the building of uh, God's church. Why would he say that? Because you had there the gates of Hades. It was the gates of Pan. Uh, you know, Pan was thought to live there, the, the Greek god Pan. And um, that gates of Hades is at the base of Mount Hermon, right? And then six days later, it says that he took Peter, James, and John, and they went to the, the top of a very high mountain. That's Mount Hermon. And when Peter gets up there, he's like, hey, Lord, maybe let's build a tabernacle up here, you know, one for these, for you, Moses, and Elijah. Well, in Psalm 68, it talks about Mount Bashan, the mountain of many peaks. It's the same place. Mount Bashan and Hermon are the same area. They're, they're the same, very same mountain. And Jesus takes those three guys up there. Only three. Why only three? Why not take the whole crowd? Why not take a bunch of people up there and transfigure? And then when they're coming down, he says, now, listen, guys, don't tell anybody about this. Why did you do this? I mean, what was the point? Because it wasn't for human observation. He needed witnesses, yes, but it wasn't for the benefit of humans that he did this. This was really a shot across the bow to Satan and his hoodlums that I'm coming for you. And this mountain that you claimed was yours, mm -mm, it's mine. And and I think Satan was was peeing his pants at this point because he's like, oh no, this is the day of the Lord, right? And in Psalm 68, it talks about how you know the the chariots of the Lord are ten thousand times ten thousand, and he's gonna retake the mountain. And Satan's like, oh no, this is it. This is clearly the guy who's gonna try to squash my head. So he then goes into high gear. He has to personally oversee that Jesus cannot stomp on his head. So he goes and possesses Judas. And of course we know the story, right? He betrays him, puts Jesus on the cross. All right, got that done, right? It's it's over, I don't have to worry about it. You know, soon you're gonna be reigning and you're gonna be living in my kingdom, dead, the kingdom of death, and I will own you. And that's where it says in Psalm 22, that the mighty bulls of Bashan, are, they're, they're, they're gaping at him with their mouths open like roaring lions. This is where we're getting a window into the spiritual realm as Jesus is on the cross, enduring this terrible suffering. And 
based on on what it says there in in Psalm 22, it means that these spiritual entities, these demons, are are basically they're mocking him. Oh, the son of man, you're gonna step on our head. I don't think so, right? You went up there and made a big display on Mount Hermon. Yeah, but look at you now. Now you're on a cross dying, and you're gonna be part of our kingdom. Well, when Jesus died, he thought it was over, but then it says that Jesus went and proclaimed, he didn't, he didn't preach the good news, it wasn't the gospel, but it was a, a proclamation, and the word is keruso. He, he proclaimed to the spirits who were formerly disobedient in the days of Noah. I, I see those very much as, as the same entities that were put into eternal chains of darkness until the judgment of the great day, right? He was telling them, you're not getting out. And what's crazy is, according to uh, the, the Jewish literature, they believed that the gates of Hades were going to burst open and all these demons were going to come out with, you know, shooting arrows. And we know what they look like, too, because the description in Revelation chapter 9, uh, paired up with a Kadura stone from 1200 BC, shows us what they look like. They were, um, well, they look like Nimrod, actually. Because they were this hybridized creature, part lion, part horse, part human, uh, also with a lion's head, a scorpion's tail, really scary creatures. And I think Satan was trying to open the gate. And I think when Jesus said the gates of Hades will not prevail, I think what he was saying is they're not going to be opening on my watch. And here's why. Because I'm going to go down there. He didn't state all that, right? But we know what he did. He went down. He proclaimed something to those spirits that were in prison back then, probably expecting to get out. And they were, of course, very shocked when he took the keys to uh, death and Hades and said, I'll take those, thank you. And that's how he was able to get the scroll, right, to get authority over that scroll so he can open it later in the, in the end times, he'll be opening that scroll. And we know that those entities that are down there are going to come out according to Revelation chapter nine. But of course, Satan didn't know when that day would come. And so I think he was trying to open it back then. And Jesus basically said, mm -mm, not going to happen. But imagine the frustration when he realized, oh, I, <laughs> I thought I was killing this guy. And all I did was help God accomplish his plan. That must have really ticked him off. <laughs> which, which explains why as Jesus is taking the seals off the scroll, that's literally beginning to strip Satan's authority off of the earth, and Satan comes down with great wrath. Mm -hmm. it, yep. it, 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 it's a perfect. It, what do you it, think, Dr. Mike? Well, well, what I say is, <laughs> if you think <laughs> we're living in, if if you think we're living in exciting times right now, you better buckle up because they're going to get a lot more exciting as we go, draw closer to the return of our King, the one true King, the real hero of the story, as you conclude. Mm -hmm your book yeah. Though. yeah 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 he is absolutely the real hero which is so exciting right i mean satan tried to install his counterfeit hero sat uh nimrod and he had you know some success with that but ultimately he failed and now it doesn't mean he's not going to keep trying we know he will in fact he's going to bring back that same hero figure uh in the end times known as the beast um and and what i'm talking about in book three is the authority. He has to get that authority back. We're going to see that the beast will have authority over every tribe, tongue, and nation, right? And there's going to be this covenant with death and shale, right? So somehow Satan's going to do it again. Um, it'll be real. It'll be crazy. It'll be very dangerous. But ultimately, Jesus wins in the end, and he's able to overcome that. So Satan is quite the schemer, and I have to give him a lot of credit. Is very, very clever. But thankfully, God is, you know, infinitely more clever than Satan. And he's, I, God's not sweating. He's like, oh, man, you really got me over a barrel this time. You know, God's like, whatever, dude. <laughs> you're playing five-dimensional. I'm playing ten. You know, you're dimensional chess, right? It, it's impressive, but it's not. You know, like, that's what's so cool about God is, like, he's not He's not breaking a sweat. He's not losing any sleep on this one. Um, he wins. So. Well, the Justice League or Marvel comics doesn't have a doesn't have a clue what excitement is. When I know. You actually, 
stuff back in concept and in, into context. The greatest drama in human history is is actually being played out before us if we'd have eyes to see. And yeah. the great thing is that we get to be a part of it. We're part of that ecclesia, those called out of mystery Babylon, that even the full council, the gates of hell will not prevail over us, that we were going to be on the side of the king and that we are going to see him come back. We're going to see him kosher this planet. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm really looking forward to the millennial reign. I have, Amen. I have, I have had enough of DC and the UN and all the other crazy things out there. Uh, mankind has a tendency to get stuck on stupid so quickly uh, because they're they're so easily manipulated by the evil one. Mm-hmm. And I yeah. I don't know the full scope of what the millennial reign looks like. The prophets, I mean, there's people don't realize that there are more scriptures about Jesus' second coming than there were his first. Mm. And I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what that millennial reign. I kind of got an idea, but I think I'm just scratching the surface. Yeah. And and I'm looking forward to this. Uh, Doug, where can we pick up your book? Uh, you can go to DouglasHamp.com. Uh, you can get the, the ebook there if uh, people are interested. And I have lots of other resources as well. Some of them are free, so they're certainly welcome to uh, avail themselves of those. Or they can go to Amazon.com and uh, just type in my name, Douglas Hamp, and all my books will come up. And, of course, Corrupting the Image, Volumes 1 and 2 are both there. And just a little teaser, I got book three. I'm working on that, so I'm terribly excited to release that. That'll take us from the rise of Antichrist to the return of Jesus. It's going to be awesome. It's it's truly epic. I mean, it's what a story. So uh, pretty pretty exciting stuff. Dr. Yeah. Mike, you want to share anything before we close out today? No, no. It's a fantastic uh, overview of the book. I would just encourage people to go out and get it. It will be worth your while, and it'll be a very valuable resource for you, especially uh, those of you who love to research biblical archaeological history, it's 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 going to be a very valuable asset to your library. So, yeah, I've, I've been kind of watching you this entire interview. You're just smiling like a Cheshire cat, you know. <laughs> it, all this stuff is just so good. And, <laughs> Thank uh, you guys. Thank and you. and for the way that I like to research, this this is right up my alley. Uh, this is it. I, I learned some things. I made new connections. And uh, guys, uh, and uh, Doug, I, I know with, with the connections you're making, we're in a time that God is bringing connections that we had never seen before. That there's, mm-hmm. There is the knowledge of the kingdom and the knowledge of connecting all this together. There's a special anointing uh, the Holy Spirit is bringing out to those that have ears to hear so that as we understand these things, we're going to know exactly what's going on as it unfolds before us. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And, you know, and God gets the credit because... You know, without years of research that other people have done, you know, I couldn't have made the connections that I made. But, you know, because we've had all of this research that's been done for so long by people. Some people believe the Bible, some people don't. But you start putting it all together and finally we're like, oh, I think I can connect these two dots, you know. So it's really fun to just be part of that process. Well, thank you so much for being on uh, with us today. And we're going to be doing one more of these before the end of the year. We'll be uh, with Josh Peck with uh, his new book, Digging Into the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so we're looking forward to that. God bless you, gentlemen. Thank you. God bless you.